Hello, I'm Africa 54 Managing Editor Vincent McCory. Welcome to this special edition of Africa 54. In today's special edition of Africa 54, a closer look at three members of the African diaspora who are making a difference in American politics. In Wisconsin, State Representative Samba Balde, who hails from Gambia. In Colorado, Liberia-born State Representative Naketa Ricks. And in Minnesota, State Senator Omar Fateh, whose parents hail from Somalia. Today, we will look at uh, different African diaspora groups that now make up the United States and out there fighting for representation through the voting process. VOA is profiling a group of emerging politicians from the diaspora who are changing the face of American politics. One is Wisconsin State Representative Samba Balde, who hails from the, um, uh, Gambia. My name is Samba Balde. I'm the first Gambian American elected to Wisconsin State Legislature. I came to Wisconsin almost about 21 years ago. It was uh, December of 99 was when I immigrated basically to the United States. I would call Madison my home all my American life. I've lived here. I seek political office in Madison uh, for many reasons, from race relations to just services that uh, usually local government would provide to their constituents and was not happening. Uh, housing uh, for communities of color particularly was very bad. Wisconsin ranks, I think, worst or second worst in the whole of this country. So those statistics and some of the inequalities was really what uh, uh, triggered me to consider running for office. It was in 2020 that this opportunity came uh, for me to run for uh, state assembly. And I think diversity and my record at the city council really spoke uh, to my community as to whether or not I can serve them well at the state level. Generally, the way I reach out to my community is I do have coffee out there in the community, uh, what I would call uh, listening sessions uh, for my constituent uh, members. And, you know, in many cases, in fact, it's people who do not look like me in terms of skin color who comes to this meeting and express their concerns and things like that or issues that they are faced with. What is it that you are challenged with? What is it that you would like to see me uh, uh, go after before my time ends or my mandate with you ends? My son is 10, he has ADHD, a sensory processing disorder, a mood and adjustment disorder, and what's called disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. I have been the biggest advocate for him, but I have had the hardest time finding resources. You can call your name yep. and email address here. Absolutely. We'll provide and probably arrange uh, more meetings with you sure. and maybe. And so those interaction has been very, very good. You know, when I was elected, I was the first Muslim ever to be elected at the city council, the first African uh, immigrant to be in the council. But by the time I left, we have two Muslims uh, to be elected, one of them a female. I think uh, I measure my success through giving access uh, to my community, but also at least having uh, some of my community members be part of uh, city and local government. Thank you to all of you for being here. Thank you also for believing in me and supporting me and voting for me and just being part of uh, my life journey. I'm very appreciative of all that. What we would do after every elections, all the elections that I've run, is to organize kind of a thank you get together for our community members, uh, both for my district, but also the, you know, the immigrant community, particularly to stop by and socialize so I can hear from them, but also say thank you to all of them. Uh, so as you can see also, I have some elected official, but also leaders in the community up here to say something, uh, but also my beautiful wife here, Fadu Jao. Yeah. So obviously without her, I couldn't have been here. Yeah. <laughs> Me and my wife met uh, maybe about 13 years ago when I was visiting the village at Gambia. Was that 
that the happiest day of your life? Yes, that was the happiest day. <laughs> She's been very supportive. It is excellent. Without her uh, giving me peace of mind coming home, I couldn't take it this far. So I'm, I'm, I'm very appreciative of that. I just visited Gambia. Uh, part of that visit was to visit family members. Assalamu alaikum. So um, I traveled to the village where I grew up, uh, Choya. As part of that visit, obviously, it was a traditional welcome. They met, you know, with us, the entourage, I would call it. And then we're drumming and dancing and just, you know, welcome home and things like that. And so the highlight of my trip, obviously, is my mom and the family that I met. But also the fact that I was able to meet the president of the Republic of the Gambia, spend over two hours with him, got invited to lunch. Uh, to me, that is very special and humbling, and but something that I'll remember for a very long time. But also seeing, you know, many of uh, the now grown up that I started school with who never wanted to go to school. I personally forced my way into school to see them where they are now and just to uh, chat about our childhood uh, and how I took a different path from what they were interested in was really also another reminder of uh, how every encounter you can count towards uh, the person you end up being in life. The different diaspora groups that make up the United States inevitably are fighting for representation through the voting process. Colorado State Representative Nequita Ricks hails from Liberia. Hi, my name is Naquita Ricks. I am a Colorado State Representative for House District 40. I have learned so many things in my freshman session as a state legislator. I have learned how to pass bills. I have learned, you know, how to conduct myself in the Committee of the Whole. It's been a very fascinating place to learn about, you know, the politics, how laws are passed, serving on the different committees, the Business and Labor Committee, also the Public Health and Behavior Committee that I served on. We responded yeah. to so many earlier this year when yeah. the unemployment issue was going on, but now yeah. we're getting the results, so that's a good yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. Hearing about Colorado's problems and coming up with solutions to fix it through these bills has been just so rewarding for us. One out of every 10 persons here in Colorado is an immigrant. Six out of every small businesses here are started by immigrant entrepreneurs like myself. The state of Colorado, the House of Representatives convened in the 73rd General Assembly, hereby extends sincere tribute to the immigrants and immigrants descended families of Colorado in honor of National Immigrant Heritage Month. I offer this tribute as a refugee and the first African immigrant to serve in the Colorado State House. My own family came to Colorado um, in 1980 after a bloody military coup in Liberia, West Africa, where I'm from. My mother was held at gunpoint for over two hours while my sister and I watched. We didn't know if she was going to live or die in that encounter. And the reason why they were interrogating her was because she was engaged to a government official. When they found him, they dragged him to our driveway um, along with my mother. And just by the grace of God, she was not taken. After a few days, they had rounded up all 13 ministers of the government and they tied them and shot them by firing squad. Within a couple months of that occurrence, we were able to come to the United States, eventually got here to Aurora, where I live today. Thank you, Representative Briggs. And so to stand there in the State House and be representing my district, um, that moment was just really striking for me. And I, you know, it was just a lot to process. But I think that's what we talk about when we say that we talk about American dream. Um, I think people come from all over the world, escaping famine, war, political unrest like we did and they come to seek a better life and I've been so fortunate to be blessed here in Colorado not only representing my district but to start my own business to raise my daughter and to be able to contribute to others within my community is is a true joy 
So this is Aurora Central High School. This is where I spent four years and coming to America, leaving all my friends in Liberia and now having to make new friends. This school is predominantly um, immigrant because there's so, so many people here um, that, that are from many different countries. I mean, it's a very, very diverse school. It's one of the most diverse ones within the rural public schools. I remember walking in snow my first time. <laughs> oh God. We were walking to school and I kept slipping and my friends kept laughing at me. It, it was just silly, but I, I didn't have, like, I guess, snow feet at the time. <laughs> this is my neighborhood that I grew up in. We lived here for about a year before we moved down the street on East Colfax and Joliet. My mom had to work so much harder to do everything and start all over. And within 10 years of coming, she, she died from cancer. So, um, and my sister and I didn't have a mom and my father died shortly, you know, so we've gone through a whole lot of stuff and I try not to dwell there, but I know that they put enough in us to try to make a difference and to go after your dreams. I think we should always dream, always reach for something, always have something that you're going to. I've had lots of traumatic experiences, but there's something on the inside that keeps me going. I'm a person of faith. I keep praying. I fall down. I get up. And I said, never give up. Never give up on your dreams. There's always something. Tomorrow's another day, and the sun will come out. Don't give up on your dreams ever. Now let's look at the African diaspora member who is the U.S. shadow representative for Washington, D.C., Oyewo Lewa, whose parents hailed from Nigeria. This is Dr. Oye Owolewa. I live in Washington, D.C., and I'm the first Nigerian-American elected as U.S. representative. I took my oath of office on January 2nd in front of the Martin Luther King Memorial in D.C. Preserve and protect and defend the Constitution of the United States and the District of Columbia Home Rule Act. Everybody who were with me from day one was there. My younger brother, who's my best friend, who also served as my treasurer, my right-hand man, they were able to witness me give my commencement speech to becoming D.C.'s first Nigerian-American federal official. I just thought about everybody that got me to this point. My parents, who were born and raised in Nigeria, who taught me about community, about selflessness, giving back to others. Also, all the people who have invested in me, whether it's teachers, whether it's my current neighbors, just everything that brought me to that point. It was a very overwhelming experience. Together, we will fight for change and finally achieve D.C. statehood. When I first ran for U.S. representative, it was all about bringing equality for D.C. residents. Right now, we pay taxes. We pay our fair share as American citizens, but we don't get back what everybody else says. So I was born and raised in Massachusetts. I didn't realize coming into D.C., I'll be forfeiting my rights. And there are people who were born and raised in D.C. who never had the rights that our neighbors in Maryland and Virginia have. My other message was being a representative to people who share my perspective, the Nigerian Americans, the millennials, black people, Muslim Americans, anybody who sees themselves fighting to see themselves represented, I have shared that voice, and that's why I bring to the lawmaking process. But the Capitol siege had a huge consequence, not only physically for D.C., but our spirit as well. It also highlighted the importance of D.C. statehood, the ability to defend ourselves, create our own laws, create a budget to prevent this from happening again. Unlike other representatives of other states, this seat is a non-voting, non-seated U.S. representative. So I don't get any federal funding or a budget for my office. So because of that, I still continue my day practice as a healthcare professional. And what that has done is inspired me to also focus on healthcare just as much as, as D.C. statehood. So this is the first shot of two. So once I'm able to become a seated voting member of Congress, 
I'm going to work on changing our health care system, make sure it's fair and affordable for every American. Being a health care worker, I really, really believe that there's an opportunity for me to educate the community about vaccines, especially the COVID vaccine. My name is Dr. Oye Owolewa, U.S. Representative. I'm working with the mayor's office to make sure people are vaccinated. Have you gotten vaccinated already? I hear a lot of lawmakers saying, trust the science. But being a healthcare provider and elected official, I feel like I have the perspective and the opportunity to really educate the community on the, on the mass level. And it's really good to do your part and make sure that the country is safer. And I believe getting vaccinated is a step to get making our country safer and ready to open again. All right, guys. And like I said, thanks for doing your part to get us past the pandemic. Thank you. And if you know anybody else who needs to get one, they can do the same thing. All right. Awesome. Thank All right, you. guys. My family back in Nigeria and extended friends, they are extremely proud of this accomplishment. This is the first time a Nigerian American has been elected to such a position. And they see this as not only as a win for me, but also an opportunity for the younger generation to get more inspired in the political process. And not even just Nigerian Americans, but just people from all the diaspora. Because we come here, we excel academically, we achieve a lot, but right now there's not a lot of political capital in our communities. So this is an opportunity for us to really get involved in a lawmaking process. But as a black man as well, I feel like this is also an opportunity for young black people to understand that this is our opportunity to take our energy in the streets and bring it to a lawmaking table. This is an opportunity to really be involved in the solutions of what's going on in our community and just make life just a little bit more comfortable, a little bit easier for the, for the next person. And that's an opportunity that I take very, very seriously. Our next profile is on Minnesota State Representative Esther Agbaje, whose parents are from Nigeria. My name is State Representative Esther Agbaje. I represent House District 59B, which covers downtown Minneapolis and parts of North Minneapolis. It's a pretty vibrant uh, district. It's got diversity in its economic classes and it's got diversity in its ethnic groups and racial groups. And it's really just a fun place to live and I'm really happy to be their representative. My parents came to the United States in the 1980s. They both immigrated from Nigeria, and they both actually came to Minnesota to attend the University of Minnesota, which is where they met. I have always had jobs that were in this space of uh, helping people or ensuring that people had the resources they needed to do something better for themselves. So one thing that I was interested in was how do we help more people at once? Often that means going to a lever of government. Um, so that was why I was always keen on the idea of running for office. The opportunity arose for the 2020 cycle and I jumped at it. I was born and raised right here in Minnesota. And I am passionate about representing 59B because I wanna build the most inclusive district in our state. Very big difference between campaigning and legislating. When you're campaigning, you're very full of ideas and you're full of hope <laughs> and you're full of vision, which stays with you once you start legislating. Um, but there becomes now, in Minnesota, we have a total of 201 legislators between our House of Representatives and our Senate. And so you are just one of 200 other people that you have to convince uh, to be able to uh, bring your idea and your constituents' ideas into fruition uh, to create policy and change. So. Uh, there's much more negotiating once you become a legislator. The member from Hennepin, Representative Ag Bage. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. This pandemic has exacerbated the problems that we have in housing. And this bill, though not everything we want, will mitigate kind of the worst of those problems, particularly for people who have lost their jobs and cannot afford the rent. A lot of people talk about the pandemic saying the pandemic showed the inequalities and inequities in our society. All the pandemic did was just shine a brighter light on them. We have been dealing with a housing crisis in Minnesota for years. And that is one of the things that I actually want the state of Minnesota to 
be bold and step forward on how do we provide dignified, adequate housing for all members of our society. Well, I think about all the work you've done on housing in particular, just being able to see it all the way through from the mm -hmm. perspective you have is so valuable um, because without that, we're not gonna get the solutions that people actually need. Mm -hmm. You know, me and a couple of other uh, legislators have released statements that have gone against the grain of the traditional DFL leadership. Um, and I don't think that's a bad thing. I think we need all of those perspectives so that way we're getting, we're getting a real sense of what real people are dealing with. And so I think, as we get more people who are, you know, people oriented, justice focused, I think that that means we can do a lot more uh, better work for the state of Minnesota. I think across the world, there are people who with less means, so less money, um, maybe people in marginalized groups in their countries who are, as they have been standing up. I think 2020 was a big year for that particularly with the pandemic. I think the movement in Nigeria is young people were rising up, standing up against, to, to want a government to work for them. Um, so I applaud their efforts. I think same with young people across the United States and across the world who are standing up and saying, you know, our rights count for something. I wholeheartedly, you know, agree with them and want them to succeed in their efforts. And I, as a young person here who is in a seat of decision-making and also working to make sure that we are doing the work to support everyday working people. As a legislator, it's definitely eye-opening to see the challenges, but also the opportunities um, across the state of Minnesota. And I think that many of my fellow legislators or decision-makers, especially those with immigrant backgrounds, can also see those same challenges and opportunities. And we welcome collaboration with anyone. In our final diaspora profile, let's look at Minnesota State Senator Omar Fatem, whose parents are originally from Somalia. My name is Omar Fate. I'm the state senator for District 62 in South Minneapolis. Um, I was born in Washington, D.C. and raised in Virginia. Um, and on, on the campaign trail and along with my colleagues, I've been telling them that I'm growing up in an immigrant household, but within the American culture, which is a melting pot of ideas, uh, thoughts, religions, uh, and so on. Um, I think I was best to bridge the gap between the new immigrants as well as uh, the folks that uh, have been here. I, Omar Fata, do solemnly serve to support the Constitution of the United States. I'm blessed to represent uh, a very diverse district uh, in South Minneapolis. Um, it's a lot of working class folks. These are folks that have been really hit really hard uh, this past year with uh, uh, George Floyd murder, the uprising that followed, uh, but as well as COVID-19, uh, which impacted all of us. I regularly go to Lake Street, uh, which uh, are mostly Latino-owned businesses, and I've made that connection with them to help them um, understand what resources are out there uh, in COVID and in general. I've built a relationship with folks in Little Earth um, to understand indigenous issues, but also what they want to prioritize in the upcoming sessions. When we speak to them, uh, we make sure that we understand that they're not a monolith, right? So if you go into Little Earth, you don't assume that everybody has the same idea or thought process. That's, not, that's just not how it is. Um, so I was fortunate enough to form uh, committees within these different communities um, so that they can help educate me, but also I take their ideas back to the legislature with me um, to turn it into action and into bills. So a lot of the bills that we come up with are actually uh, constituent uh, run and ideas uh, that uh, we brought with us in these meetings. So we're here at Kaimar Mall, located in South Minneapolis. Um, there are two Somali malls here in South Minneapolis, both in my district. This is one of the areas that was hit hardest. Uh, by COVID-19. Uh, for the first few months uh, during the pandemic, uh, people really struggled. We had businesses here shut down, um, but they rebounded. They came back. Uh, we had uh, the customers continue to come and support uh, these locally owned, immigrant owned businesses, and they continue to thrive. So they really bounced back from COVID-19. We have a lot of business owners um, that are 
immigrant-owned businesses, specifically within the daycares, uh, child daycares and adult daycares, um, home care owners, group home owners, and folks that have struggled uh, with the administrative side of the Department of Human Services. Um, one of the things I try to do is bridge the gap between um, the immigrant community, but also their government, the commissioners, assistant commissioners. Um, I've had meetings with the departments as well as the business owners so that they can fully understand um, the, any policy changes that are coming up, for example. If they've had any issues with their businesses, they can better understand um, how to function and organize. Um, but also bringing the businesses together so that they get to know one another as well, so that when they're interacting with government, um, they're united as one voice rather than uh, individual businesses. And that has proven to be successful. This is George Floyd Square. Uh, it is a memorial, a remembrance for uh, George Floyd and the murder that occurred uh, a little over a year ago now. Folks are coming from all over to come pay their respects, um, look at the memorial, but also um, come to these black businesses that are over here, the coffee shops, the restaurants, the tea bars. We've seen uh, a massive increase in crime uh, following the murder of George Floyd. Uh, and we've seen people attribute that to maybe having less officers or uh, we need more police. When that's not the case, um, we have to remember that because of COVID, uh, people, a lot of people lost work. Uh, a lot of people went on unemployment. A lot of people uh, were struggling to pay rents. And then couple that with uh, the murder of George Floyd, which was a national murder. People saw uh, an innocent black man getting tortured to death for nine minutes. Uh, people took to the streets. They were really upset. I represent the district in which George Floyd was murdered. And the uprising that followed uh, really hurt uh, a lot of folks, both the protesters but also business owners. I'm hoping to continue the good work um, that our office as well as our colleagues have done here. Um, so making sure that we prioritize public safety, making sure that we're investing in affordable housing and public housing so that we're not pricing out our, our residents and we're preserving uh, our diversity and making sure that we have a single-payer healthcare system that's not tied to employment so that we make sure that healthcare is fundamentally a human right. And that's all for this special edition of Africa 54. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. On behalf of the team here in Washington, thank you for watching our special program.